Good afternoon, everyone. I don't. Can you all hear? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> so good afternoon. I'm Daphne Benayoun, associate partner at Dalberg Advisor. And I'm Jean-Charles Guinchard, also an associate partner at Dalberg Advisors. And we have Ilia. <laughs> Uh, we are thrilled to welcome you today uh, to our live pitch and Q&A session on uh, inclusive and innovative off-grid solutions in Africa. But before we dive in into the introduction and the session in itself, we wanted to ask you a quick question so that we have all a common understanding of the scale of challenges that our amazing change makers are striving to tackle. So let's start with the question. What do you think is the amount in Africa alone of uh, renewable energy investment needed to achieve the universal access uh, to electricity goal by 2030? We have two options here, either between 10 and 30 billion a year or between 60 and 90 billion a year. So by a show of hands, who thinks it's between 10 and 30 billion? Okay. And I assume that the rest is... <laughs> okay, so actually the majority was right, uh, if it works, but no. Ah, yeah. Uh, so it's between 60 and 90 billion dollars. So what does it mean? If we compare that to the actual level of investment, we estimate that in 2018, the actual level of investment in renewable energy capacity in Middle East and Africa was 16 billion. So quite a staggering difference, right? What's actually interesting is that even though there's still momentum, it was 61% more than the year before. Actually, what we first witnessed firsthand is the growing appetite of commercial and semi-commercial investors to invest in renewable energy investment in emerging market and especially in Africa. Uh, at Dalberg, we've actually been privileged to advise some of the biggest transactions in off-grid space in Africa over the last few years. And that's why we're particularly excited to give the opportunity to our two promising uh, startups that you'll hear more about just after, uh, to pitch to an investor uh, that is also represented here, uh, active in the sector uh, to scale up um, energy uh, projects in Africa. On the investor side, we have the privilege to welcome on stage Frédéric Pfister, who is uh, the director of Off Grid Africa at Neote Capital, which is the world's first investor specialized in distributed renewable energy and electric mobility services. And on the entrepreneur side, we are happy to welcome Yusuf Bilesanmi, who is a founder and director of Eja Ice, and uh, <coughs> sorry, um, Shenda Blumen, who is founder of uh, Mobility for Africa. They will tell you, of course, a bit more about what they are doing, but, but in a nutshell, Eja Ice is a startup that supplies solar powered refrigerators to women working in the Nigerian fisheries supply chain. And Mobility for Africa um, delivers uh, solar powered solutions, transport solutions to women and their family that are efficient, affordable, and adapted to the rural and peri urban uh, areas of, uh, of Africa. Now, before we give the floor to our brilliant change makers, we wanted to share with you a very brief sense of uh, the, the objectives behind this session and the reasons why we at Dalberg were especially keen to organize this specific session. You need, uh, you need, <laughs> you need some headphones, yes. Yeah. Um, so we will end this session with a Q&A uh, moment during which you will be able to engage with our panelists and discuss their broader perspective on the challenges when you need to uh, scale up an innovative and impact-focused uh, solutions in the African environment. So what we hope to achieve with this session is actually threefold. First, we want to give our talented entrepreneurs an opportunity to get some direct feedback from a sector-focused investor. We want to help them understand better and engage with the um, investment ecosystem and to understand how they can actually meet their objectives. And the second aspect is to provide uh, a sector-focused investors, such as Neote, an opportunity to step in the shoes of uh, some social impact focused uh, entrepreneurs. 
And eventually, we think that there is a, th a third takeaway that could be beneficial to all of us. Uh, because at the, uh, after all, this is the first opportunity for our panelists to engage and discuss in front of you the challenges that they are facing when they try to scale up and innovative solutions uh, on, this, on this sector. Um, now, the reasons why, ab among all sectors, we were especially keen at Dahlberg to organize this specific discussion is that our panelists and the topic is completely aligned with our objectives and our vision. What we are is a mission-driven organization, which means that across all our 26 offices globally, and regardless of the services we deploy on a specific project, where from advisory to human-centered design, from uh, research to data analytics, we are doing it with one and unified uh, motivation to work to build a more sustainable and more inclusive world where all people everywhere can achieve their fullest potential. So uh, we are particularly thrilled that our two entrepreneurs have put and placed gender and woman, and woman empowerment at the core of their mission and solutions. We at Dalberg believe that to achieve any and all of the SDGs, we'll need to apply a gender lens to the project. That's why we actually recently signed the neutral is not enough pledge to co and committed to apply a gender lens to all of our project and initiative to increase the impact of our work. We believe that Change Now is also a great platform to challenge the way the impact ecosystem, investors, businesses can actually think about inclusivity. We believe also that small and growing businesses is the lifeblood of an in including growth in emerging market. And that a big part of the solution to achieve the SDG, uh, SDG sorry, is to help scale local innovative solutions and connect them with the right player, player, oh, sorry, players along the way uh, and get the job done. Uh, maybe a last figure, we estimate that the funding gap for MSMEs in emerging market is $5 trillion, quite a huge number. It's basically three times the GDP of all sub-Saharan countries combined. So the challenge is vast and we have very little time to address it. Uh, that's why we believe that big global platforms are actually needed to, to scale and connect uh, players and investors uh, to achieve real impact. At Dahlberg, we design and launch Convergence that you probably have heard, which is a blended finance deal sourcing platform that connects stakeholders across sectors, as well as an initiative like Unleash that Ilya will actually speak briefly about. And that's also why we're a proud partner of Change Now and the Change Now Summit. Now, Ilya? Yeah, thank you. I just need the, the clicker. Yeah. So my name is Ilya. I'm also part of the Dalberg um, team here. I also have uh, one question for you guys today. And basically is this, how much of the population in Sub-Saharan Africa has access to electricity today? It's the same kind of, raise your hands. So we're gonna go for the first is 44%. Yeah. The other option is 78%. Not the optimistic crowd today. Well, obviously, unfortunately, it's only 44%. Now, this figure tells a story, right? Imagine if you all didn't have access to electricity on a daily basis. All the tasks, the experiences that you go through in your daily lives, from waking up in the morning, putting on uh, the, the oven to, to heat your food, uh, charging your iPhones, going on the, onto the internet, and when you go out into the world, you're gonna see traffic lights, you're gonna use payment systems, I mean, electricity really, really drives a lot of what we, uh, what we take for granted every day in our lives. So these statistics at least tell us a story about a challenge in and of itself. But for, for us, it also tells a bigger story about the huge need for development that still exists in the world today. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a figure that tells a story about inequality, but it also tells a story about a lot of lost opportunities. Um, we also have the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and they obviously tell a lot bigger story than just the statistics about a huge range of issues and topics and challenges that we need to address. From eradicating poverty to dealing with climate change to figuring out how we, um, how we deal with unsustainable consumption. But the SDGs also tells us a different story. It tells us a story that 
to take action on all these challenges. It's not just a task for governments, and it's not just a task for international organizations. Every single stakeholder has to take responsibility, and ideally, everyone, each and every one of us, should be able to drive change, to change the situation that we find ourselves in, and hopefully contribute to make like better lasting solutions to some of these major, major problems. So with that understanding of the challenges, that everyone needs to be responsible, that everyone needs to be able to drive change. Uh, we developed a project called Unleash, which is basically, as we say here, uh, an engine for change. So what it is, is that it's an it's a, it's a innovation lab that we do once a year uh, across the world, leading up to 2030. We want to bring in 1,000 young people every year to meet up with facilitators, experts, and mentors to drive ideas that they have from experiences on the ground and see if they can come up with good solutions to do that. So far, we've had three of these, one in Denmark, where it all started. We've had one in Singapore, and then just last year, a couple of months ago, in China. And as I mentioned, we want to do this every year leading up to 2030. One, to see if we can find a lot of great solutions to the SDGs, but also to build a movement of change makers who know each other uh, across the globe and can benefit from that understanding and those perspectives to drive their own, um, their own ideas forward. But of course, um, at the core of, of the Unleash is the idea that we can enable people to take the future into their own hands. It's basically giving people the tools that they need to be smart about figuring out what is the problem, such as uh, refrigerating fish, from the market and then drive it somewhere else and make it a solution that can work for everyone. So we also really try to look at how can we support the good ideas that come out of it by bringing people into events such as this or by bringing along investors or by bringing along mentors and experts who can drive the technical development of solutions. So I'm actually really happy to uh, to bring some of the, uh, the people here today. Yes, in the same spirit, let's get this live matchmaking session started. I will invite our speakers to join the stage and I will ask uh, Frederic if you'd like to uh, present uh, shortly what uh, Neote is about. Sure, thank you. Hi everyone, Th thank you for joining. Uh, I'm Frédéric, uh, Director of, of Grid Africa Department with uh, Neoti Capital. Uh, we'll just give you a quick introduction uh, on our company, what we do, how we do it, and then I will let uh, our two entrepreneurs pitch their project. So Neoti Capital, uh, in a nutshell, we've been incorporated in 2016 and we aim at financing a transition uh, towards clean energy and clean mobility. Uh, we have two main shareholders, EDF, the French utility, and Mitsubishi Corporation. And uh, we are the tool to address uh, electric mobility and uh, off-grid energy in Africa. Uh, we have already 60 million committed uh, to be invested uh, in the coming years. And we intend to, to deploy uh, 200 million in, of investment uh, by the end of 2020. Uh, what we provide uh, to our partners uh, is a way to remove uh, barriers uh, linked to uh, technical risk uh, and capex deployment, uh, both in electric mobility and uh, off-grid energy. If you want to start a project, uh, the upfront investment is quite high, uh, usually several million. Uh, most of the entrepreneurs don't have that kind of cash to invest, and that's where Neoti intervenes. Uh, we finance the assets uh, for our partners and we list them uh, to the partners so uh, they can deploy their project uh, without cash issues. Uh, we try to be a one-stop shop for financing solutions, meaning we provide both debt and equity. Uh, we have a technical department uh, advising uh, our partners uh, on the technical aspect of their projects. Uh, and we also provide asset management services. Uh, we are a long-term investor, meaning we, we can stay up to 20 years in a project. We don't need to exit after five years. Uh, here you have a quick description of the kind of assets we, we want to finance. 
uh, in a stationary energy, uh, it would be mini grid uh, or a power plant dedicated to CNI and SMEs. Uh, you, you can have also individual distributed systems like solar home system, solar powered uh, water pump. And in mobility, uh, we finance uh, every kind of uh, vehicle uh, from trottinet uh, to scooters uh, or utility vehicles. Uh, here you have the range of services we can provide with those assets. Uh, battery as a service, system as a service, distributed energy, uh, charge as a service, you name it. We, we try to be as flexible as possible uh, and to finance as many services as possible. Uh, we also have a technical department, as I mentioned earlier, uh, which is focusing on batteries. Uh, batteries are the link between the mobility and the off-grid platform. And we think uh, by better understanding uh, how to improve lifetime of a battery, uh, you can change the economic equation and therefore bring more profitability to your uh, investments uh, and be able to address uh, different kind of uh, businesses. Uh, quick presentation of our two main shoulders, but I guess they are uh, already uh, known enough, so no need to, <laughs> to talk too much about them. Maybe a few words about the way we invest. Uh, we invest through uh, two investment platforms that in turn invest in dedicated vehicles, meaning uh, if I want to partner with uh, Edge Eyes, I won't uh, directly invest uh, in, it, uh, in this company but through a dedicated vehicle and I will uh, sign a partnership with him through a service agreement, meaning I will pay for the asset, so I will take the payment risk for end users. Uh, AGIs won't have to, uh, to pay uh, the upfront payment for, for the asset, which would be a relief for him, and uh, through an operation and service agreement, uh, together we'll operate and maintain those assets. And uh, to conclude, uh, just a quick focus on both platforms. The one dedicated to mobility, the sharding structure is uh, slightly changing. Uh, still Mitsubishi and EDF, but we have the French CDC, Caisse des Dépôts et Consignations, uh, which has a mandate to invest mainly in Europe. And for African platform, uh, it's no longer working. Sorry. No. Uh, up. Anyway, it was not that interesting. I would just to just wanted to mention Meridiam. Sorry if someone from Meridiam is uh, in the room. Uh, they are a partner for Africa. They are uh, very well known infrastructure funds, uh, and uh, they help us to address off-grid uh, issues. So let's our pitching session begin. Uh, we'll start with uh, Yusuf. He will pitch for five minutes and have five minutes yeah. feedback from Frederic. Then Shanta will pitch for five minutes and have five minutes feedback from Frederic. And we can then go to the Q&A session where we'll have, you will have an opportunity to actually ask questions on, uh, for our panelists. So Yusuf. Every one in every three fishes never make it to the table. So one in every three fishes that, you, that has been taken out of the sea never makes it to the table. And if we were to put a context to that, that's 171 million metric tons of fish that's been captured every year. 35% of that, which is 59.8 million metric tons, goes to waste. Now this waste cuts across fishes that have been thrown back into the sea, as well as fishes that, are, that go to rot because of infrastructural challenges. Now, looking at the fish that goes to rot because of infrastructural challenges, we figure out that that's 65%. That makes up a whooping 38.8 million metric tons of fish that goes to waste every year. My name is Yusuf Bilesami. I'm a Nigerian and I'm the founder of Edge Eyes. Now, I'll, uh, I'll take that numbers to Nigeria and, and give you some more context. 
So in Nigeria, we have an annual fish demand of 3.3 million metric tons. Now, this 3.3 million metric tons cuts across 2.1 million metric tons for imports, as well as 1.2 million metric tons for local production. A lot of this fish is being handled by women in the value chain who collect it, retail it, and trade it. Unfortunately, due to the epileptic power solution, a lot of these fishes go to waste. So, bringing this to my own personal experience, in 2017 December, my, my mom uh, asked me to go help her get some fish um, in the market. And there was a full crisis at the time. And getting to the market, I met with a lady who sells the fish, and I said, look, I'd like to buy this fish. And unfortunately, the fish looked really wobbly. It was already deteriorating. And she said something to me that, that struck me the whole of the, of the holiday. She said, but what am I going to do with the fish? I can't sell it. I, I'm going to lose money if I can't sell it. I can't, I can't you know, have an income. And I said, don't worry, I'll come see you in January. So for the rest of the holiday, I spent a lot of time thinking around how could I supply you know, reliable source of powers to our business. She has a refrigerator. She doesn't just have power. So I went back to see her in January, and I designed a solar system for her, which was going to cost her about $3,500. She's not making that much. And she, she humbly declined. I then went to the banks, and I spoke to the banks. And now, it was at that point I discovered a much more bigger problem, which is that the banks don't even want to lend anything to her. They don't want to help her, they don't want to get into the system. And I had to sit back and do two things. Design a product that I could sell and design a business model that could make room for affordability. So we went back and redesigned our um, own refrigerators and were able to take it down to the market for $700 from $3,500 initially, as well as look at the social system within the markets where you have cooperatives and micro lending to be able to afford the refrigerators. With that, we were able to go back to the market with a model that is easily acceptable, whereby you have a lease to own model where the cooperatives procure these refrigerators on their behalf and can trade it. In so doing, what's the impact that we're looking at? Initially, for the refrigerate for the market woman, she will make a, a profit of two dollars on each sale of a box of fish. Now, with our solution, she would make thirteen dollars. Now, thirteen dollars in a whole year would help her move from making six hundred dollars in profit to making three thousand nine hundred dollars. This helps her income increment to go as far as 650 percent right as well as it affords a ownership of an asset affords uh, the opportunity to be part of a well included financial system and um, gives stability to our business and makes room for growth I would um, love to invite you all to join me on this journey to capture you know build trusts with local communities establish viable partnerships, and capture profitable opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yusuf, uh, for this uh, very nice presentation. Uh, just a few questions uh, about your, your concept. Uh, I don't want to, to sound cynical, but as an investor, uh, my main focus would be profitability. Uh, if I put money in your company or through a dedicated vehicle to, to finance your assets, uh, I need to understand what is the risk and what is the reward. Uh, so uh, in your business model, uh, I understand you, you want to sell uh, fridges uh, via a lease to own a scheme. Uh, to fishermen, uh, fishermen in, in Nigeria. Uh, my first question is, why only uh, fishermen? Okay, uh, thank you very much for that. So, it's designed not only for fisherwomen, 
what we've done is that we've designed a business model around the fisher women to ensure affordability for her. However, it's, we are able to sell to every other person who doesn't have the same financial problems as the fisher women. We've designed our, pro, our solution for the weakest in our communities so we can have a much more inclusive uh, communities. We we'll definitely have people who are willing to pay straight away for the product, but being able to design it around the needs of the fisher women creates more opportunities for her. Okay. Uh, to get a better understanding of, of your project, uh, when it comes to the market size, uh, how many units do you think you'll be able to, to sell uh, per year in the coming years? And uh, do you have the capacity to product those units? To produce, sorry? Yes, yes, we have. We've been able to, we've invested significantly in our supply chain, uh, establishing the right partnerships that, that are required. The, the, the market need is, is significant and it's really huge. Given lots of parameters from changes in lifestyles to business demands, and uh, presently in the first year, we're focused to getting as much as 600 units out in the market. I'm very sure we'll be able to exhaust that in the first six months. And then uh, given a five-year projection, we're hoping to be able to sell as much as uh, 12,000 units. We're working uh, very closely with the um, ECRI, which is the ECOWAS uh, Regional Renewable Energy Center, to be able to deploy this across 15 countries uh, around the West African region within the next two years. Okay. As of today, how many units did you already sell? Sell? Yeah, so we're still at the very early uh, startup phase. We've we've only sold about 30 units, and we we but we intend to be able to uh, identify the partnerships. Th those units we've sold has really given us insights into the market and um, clarity on 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 the on the needs as well as to validate our business models. And we are at a very important point of of scaling this forward. Okay. And to go back to the risk-reward analysis, uh, so let's focus on the risk. Yes. Uh, 700 uh, USD per unit. Yes. Uh, isn't it a bit expensive? Or? No, it's not. No, it's not. So 700 units is not uh, 700 dollars is not expensive. The reason is because we we've done two things. So from the in, from the from the consumer side. Profitability of their businesses on a daily base has an income of $13 as pure profit. This is after business. So they procure the, the, a box of fish for $27 um, for $5.5 and they sell that for $9.7. Now, with a refrigerator of our size, they can buy five box, box of fishes in contrast to just buying one for $27 and trade that for $43 and make a profit of uh, $13. At, oh, sorry, for $49, I mean that profit after operational expenses of $13. Now, with that, in a whole year, that's $3,900. At $700, within the next three months, at consistent profitability, they should be able to pay up for the assets. And we even listen that to a six-month period. The objective is not just you know, to take that money off them, but equally to help them grow. Now, looking at the risks that we've considered into this for investors, is that one, when you, when you operate in Africa, one of the challenges you have is um, the, the risk of um, currency, currency risk because of currency fluctuations. We have benchmarked our profit fairly at about $550. We are already profitable, 40% profitable at $550, but we've let that gap of um, $150 in to mitigate currency fluctuations. Right? Also, because we engage uh, cooperatives, the cooperatives equally want to be profitable. So to, rather than going after the, um, the, the traders, we could trade through the cooperatives and the cooperatives get the money off the, the, um, the fisher women. So in, 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 other, in essence, we, we, we have secured the, the profitability and mitigated the risks for investors as well as made it affordable for our consumers. Okay, based on my, my experience yeah. in solar home system, uh, one last question? Um, maybe we we'll actually can continue the discussion after. I'm afraid that we won't have, uh, sorry for that, but thank you so much for the discussions you had. Thank you. And now, Shanta, I invite you to pitch. Thank you. Thank you. It's exciting to be here. It's exciting to have this quiet session. <laughs> I'm still getting used to the technology. Um, sorry, let me... Uh, 
So uh, my name's Shanta Blumen and um, I'm the founding director of Mobility for Africa. And 25 years ago, when I first went to Africa, I lived in a rural village in northern Zambia. And the first lesson the local women taught me was how to carry water from the river about a kilometre from my home. And it was a lesson I never mastered. Um, juggling a five litre bucket of water on my head was difficult, painful and slow. And sadly, 40, uh, 25 years later, uh, UN women estimate that women in Africa still spend an 40 million hours every year carrying water. Um, so mobility is essentially a life or death matter in Africa. Long distances and lack of transport can mean that women and children die um, not getting the services they need. It means that kids don't go to school because of long distances, they drop out. It means that crops rock, rot in the market because they don't get to where they need to go in the field, they don't get to the market. And new economic opportunities are missed. Um, and while I think there's been an understanding for those that work in the development space that mobility is critical, it's been neglected. And we still have an estimated 70% of Africans living in rural areas. So they produce about 80% of the food and the majority are women. So these are the people that we are looking to try and help. Um, Mobility for Africa was started in uh, 2018, but we basically became operational last year. We launched a pilot in Zimbabwe, and our aim is to bring the electric vehicle revolution to ordinary people, to the majority of people in Africa, especially women, uh, by providing and leveraging new technology and adapting it to local contexts. Um, we know that about 40%, the estimate is, of rural Africans live at least two kilometres from an all-purpose road. So for local people, they spend a lot of time getting to the main road where they can transport their goods. So we are hoping to, to provide off-road solutions. Um, and we believe that there's, we, we've started with a tricycle that's been used in China and we are now adapting that to the local context and we've called it the Humba, which means go. And our focus is how do we work with local women and create community um, services and support to maintenance and repair. Um, I think the question for me, which is really exciting, I've been on this journey for the last three years, is, is we are now at an opportunity where we can do this. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has already told us that we need to move to green electric transport. And this should not just happen in rich countries. It needs to happen in poor countries as well if we're going to succeed. And we know already that in many parts of Africa, petrol is expensive, it's imported, it's a fossil fuel, and transport is expensive because of it. Um, with the growing um, availability of renewable energy and the exciting opportunities and investments going into electric transport, as well as uh, the battery revolution, not just for energy storage, but for energy productive purposes, we have no excuse um, to not address this problem. Um, and I, I really believe that like the digital revolution that happened, Africa can leapfrog and take advantage of these new technologies. But how do we adapt them to the places where they're needed most and to the people that need these services most? Um, so we're at the early stages of testing. Basically, we know that we have a market that needs our services, but we need to invest in the research and building the business evidence case to convince people that this is viable. Um, I mean, we know that in rural Africa, women are the drivers of local economy. And often people will say that they're too poor, but I would argue that they're the most thrifty uh, and, and, and resourceful than any, any other, anyone else. They manage to feed their families and they get their kids to school. And from our research, we know that they spend on average 20% of their income every month on transport costs. That's real money they have to spend on getting kids to school or going to the clinic. So we know that they're spending money, but it's often not efficient and it doesn't include the hours they spend wasting, uh, wait, waiting 
for transport. So we are at the moment testing different models. We have a young and dynamic team and we're working with women to work in groups. So we're doing a monthly rental scheme. Uh, we, we charge a small fee for the battery swapping um, and we're looking at new technology and how to make that more efficient. Uh, we're just about to introduce a mini taxi service uh, where the women drivers will have uh, an SMS system to contact each other. And we're also looking at different types of B2B programs, especially for local government services. Um, I mean, we, we have at the moment, I mean, a small sample with, with we've got a 90 women. We're about to expand this month to 180. And then we'll have a much broader membership in our shared transport system. And we're already starting to see the evidence. Um, it, it's shifting gender attitudes. We're focusing on women because we essentially know, as Yusuf said, that women need it and men will always get access, but we need to prove that this is viable for women and then the men can join in. Um, we're seeing amazing, we're seeing changes in income, we're seeing changes in gender, and we're also seeing improved access to services. So we're really excited that in the next few months we'll have an even stronger business case to impress Frederic um, and, and to try and leverage the type of investment we need to scale up. So thank you. Thank you very much, Anta. A very interesting presentation. Uh, that's definitely the kind of project we would be happy to invest in uh, at NEOTI. Uh, combine both uh, stationary energy with uh, electric mobility. So I understand you, you're still working on your business model. Uh, but so far, based on the first results of your, your pilot uh, phase, uh, what would be your value proposition? Uh, how do you think you, you would be more likely to, to make money and to, to monetize your Humba? So initially we had an idea that it would be a lease to purchase scheme and I think there is a demand just to outright purchase. There are those farmers that are more successful. Um, but I think we're, we're really looking now at a rental scheme and looking at different ways to use it as an asset base. We know already we've had no defaults. We've kept the rates quite low um, at, in the current pilot stage because the women are participating, so it's, you know, but we're now getting serious with testing assumptions financially. But for, we, can, we know that they can pay at least $20 to $30 a month. And we're also having a steady stream of battery swapping. So at the moment, that's a, a dollar charge for a fee. And we're working on improving that. So we've just, uh, we're shifting to lithium batteries. So we know the life cycle will be longer. We know the charging time will be less. Um, and we're looking at off-grid charging solutions. One of, the, one of the suggestions, obviously the capital investment in off-grid charging is, was quite big for our pilot. But we also know there's a lot of investment in Africa going into off-grid mini-grids. And what's happening is they don't have enough productive usage to sell. So they're not actually making the return. So our next phase is once we get the, 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 the technical issues sorted is to look at how do we partner with existing mini-grid operators to say, how do we bring this in? And obviously you want to sell your power, but you know people need more productive use of power. Charging your phone is great, you know, charging your light is great, but it's not going to raise income for me today to pay my kids' school fees. Whereas if they get mobility and they can take their goods to the market, they sell more. Um, if we can work with the battery technology to also look at um, linkages, which we, we're, we're going to experiment in our second phase to other multi-purpose battery use. So you could use it for a water pump. You know, you could, you could take the battery out, use it for um, a grinder. So all of a sudden you're unleashing all of this productivity that hasn't been capitalised on. Okay. And now if we have a look at the regulatory framework, uh, I saw a few days ago that Nigeria decided to, to ban, uh, sorry about that, uh, motorcycle and tricycle uh, that have a commercial use. Uh, how is it in Zambia and uh, how could you address such a situation? Yep. So we had some good news this week. Um, in Zimbabwe, we've lobbied the government. We've just had the import duties changed. So there will be no import duties on three-wheelers. 
And what's very interesting to me is, you know, I worked in China. So in China, this was catalytic in helping rural people there. Um, they used to have a pedal-driven uh, three-wheeler. Now they went to a two, uh, to motor, to petrol, and then to electric. There was no regulation in China. Everyone could own one. So I have been lobbying already with government and regulatory bodies to say rural, okay, per urban, fine. You do with it what you want. I don't care. For, I mean, my market is not necessarily those living in your capital city where traffic is a problem, where motorbikes are a problem. But rural areas off-road, you need a different set of rules. You need to make this accessible to rural women. Do not make it too difficult. Do not charge huge licensing fees because you will lose it. And in China, they had no, no regulation. They've only started now when it's in urban areas. So I, I, I'm very cognizant of that lobbying that needs to be done. But it's interesting, on the EV front, both Kenya and Rwanda have now set targets for electric. They're going to, all motorbikes will be moving and shifting to electric within a few years. Okay, thank you. Uh, what, what I would like to, to ask you, and that's the question I wanted to, to ask you through earlier, is uh, you're an entrepreneur, I'm an investor. So exactly what do you need? What will you do with it? And uh, what would be my reward if I decide to, to invest in your projects? So, uh, I mean, money is obviously important and I'm learning that as a new entrepreneur. <laughs> um, but time and investment space research. I, I think that there's an assumption that you, you just go, going to have a perfect business model from the onset. In Africa, you need time. You need to, a lot of this is new. You have communities that you're introducing new technologies in. You need to build trust. You need to build relationships. So time and capital. But I think if the potential is there, then the scale up, the market is there. Um, you know, you have 1.2 billion people. If We estimate there's 100 million family farms in Africa. That's a huge constituency that's being missed. But I think it's, it's, it, it's a patient investor to get through that initial stage. Thank you so much uh, to the three of you for this uh, pitching and feedback session. Uh, now I suggest that we jump on our Q&A session um, so that our panelists can share with you their broader perspective, really stepping back from these specific projects and sharing their perspectives on um, the challenges that they can face to uh, scale up an innovation, an innovative uh, solution like this. Um, maybe to give you the time uh, to prepare and share your, your questions, we can uh, start with a couple of uh, introductory uh, questions. The first one would be for Frédéric. As a green investor uh, present in Africa, what are the main challenges you're facing and what are investors like you uh, expecting most importantly? Thank you. Uh, the main challenge uh, for us in Africa uh, would be to find profitable projects uh, and suitable projects. Uh, we receive uh, on a weekly basis like uh, 10 or 20 teasers uh, many of them are very good, uh, very good ideas, but unfortunately, for some reason, we, we cannot move forward. Uh, the idea might be good, uh, but at some point, it won't be able to, to, to scale up such a project, uh, so the investment we, will stay too small. Uh, the idea is good, but the regulatory framework is not in place. Uh, if I take, for instance, a mini grids project, uh, that's something we, we like very much at NeoT and we, we think it's, uh, uh, it will be very important in the next years. Uh, in some countries, uh, the regulatory framework is not there. Uh, you, don't, you cannot set your price, so at some point, the uh, government can decide that you, you need to, to divide your price by two and therefore your profitability uh, is no longer there. Uh, you are not protected against competition from the national grid. Uh, and that's the kind of, uh, of issue we are facing on a daily basis. Uh, as an investor, what are we looking for? Uh, of course, profitability, because uh, we are not an impact fund and even a uh, development finance institution, uh, they are looking to make a profit. So, so are we. Uh, and then uh, we are also looking at the impact of our investment. Uh, so far, we, we focus on the pre-investment impact, 
uh, what we call the ENS review, environmental and uh, social impact assessment. Uh, for that, we, we are working with, uh, with dedicated uh, consul consulted firms. Uh, and what we are trying to, to assess after the investment in the social impact on population. You provide power to, to populations, what do they do with it? Uh, do they try to, to develop their business? Uh, do they go to productive use? Or do they spend uh, their whole day in front of a TV watching stupid TV shows? That's the kind of stuff we need to assess. But again, uh, such an assessment has a price. Uh, who is paying for that? Uh, we could be paying for it, but our shareholders, not sure they would be very happy uh, to see the profitability declining. Uh, that's why we are trying to put in place partnerships with uh, DFIs, universities, uh, willing to asset, uh, assess social impact uh, after investment. Thank you. Maybe one more question before we open. Um, Shantai, you come from the development community uh, and now you're just starting your entrepreneurial journey. What, do you, what has been so far the biggest challenge that you face, especially coming from a different uh, community? Um, I, I think it, it was exemplified today in a way. Um, when you work in development, um, your, your outcomes are measured very differently. Um, you know, you're looking at, did the kids all go to school? Um, did your health indicators improve? And obviously, as Frederick has indicated, if you're in the business world, the bottom line matters much more, and that's usually where the conversation starts. Um, so to me, I mean, in, having been in this space for a long time in Africa, what's interesting is, and it's exciting, there is a, it's, there's, a there's assumptions about this cha charity model that doesn't work because we don't have transformation. It doesn't, it, it doesn't lead to sustainable outcomes over the time. So now the question is obviously how do we get the right mix between sustainable social enterprise and business being included in the in in this space. We, we bring the two together um, and there's a bit of a buzzword around social enterprise and how do we impact investing but I think it's going to be hard to, to actually, it's going to take a while because I do think between the profit and the social outcomes, we've got to find a way to meet that middle ground. Maybe we open the floor to questions. Uh, we have a mic, yeah. <laughs> so, raise your hand, okay. Hello, okay. Hello everyone, I would, have, I would like to ask a question for Yusuf. Um, did you think about building another kind of business model which would involve renting instead of selling? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. Yes, yes, we did consider that. And we let it out of our business model for two reasons. So one, uh, when we look at the market, there are a few companies doing something similar. We have a company called Doulas, which is a British company. They sell solar powered um, refrigerators for um, medical purposes. Then we have another company called Cold Hubs. What Cold Hubs does is that it has a huge refrigeration facility, and you can just bring a box of fish and refrigerate it and walk away. And that's 200. Um, uh, let's say about let's say about a dollar for I was gonna say the cost in Naira, but let's say about a dollar, you know, uh, to refrigerate it and take it away. The outcomes, however, is you've only refrigerated it from your operational cost. You go back with nothing. Your profitability wouldn't change. It doesn't change anything in the ownership. I think for for us, the opportunity and the, the reason why our business model is designed the way it is is the experience I had when I went to the banks to lobby on behalf of, of the fishermen and they were totally turned down. So you don't own an asset, you would never own an asset, you'd never be financially included, you would never grow. The 2017 um, World Bank reports states that most African uh, businesses can never scale. If you can't scale, you can't grow, right? And businesses start to end with the same, you know, farm does it never 
grows to generational opportunities. You have the African um, uh, trade uh, network emerging. How will businesses benefit from that when they can't scale? So our interest is really centered on enabling this business and these women own assets and grow uh, as a business to be much more profitable. Thank you very much. Thank you. A, a question for both entrepreneurs. Do you feel that you have room for choice when it comes to the types of investors that you speak to or are you more takers in those types of conversations? And if it's, if it's the former, what are the types of questions that you ask yourselves when picking which investors to talk to? Want me to go first? So, in, in selecting an investor, my primary concern is beyond money, what are you bringing on the table? Beyond money, are you going to be able to contribute to the R&D efforts that we keep, you know, ongoing on with? Are you going to be able to, to influence the, the financial system as we lobby to influence the financial system? Will you be able to help us scale into new markets the same way we, we you know, intend to enter those markets beyond just profitability for the company, but the company's own uh, impact mission and its ability to execute on that. So that's important. It's important to, to get funding, which really eases um, you know, what needs to be done next year to procure and, and to deliver. But having partners that can help us go beyond that to achieve the primary uh, purpose um, is equally as important as the finance. So, so I'll, I'll admit, I was a bit naive when I started this. I just assumed the need is there. It's brilliant. Aren't you going to give me some money? And so what I've discovered is obviously this is a journey. You have to... Doors will open when they're ready, in a way. That's, that, that's my new mantra. Keeps me calmer than thinking they're all going to open at once. And in this impact investment world, as we know, there's a huge spectrum. And so we have really started at the philanthropy end of that spectrum, where there is a growing ecosystem of foundations that want viable models and willing to give you more time and research to build a proof of concept. So that's sort of the starting point. And I think in Africa that money is incredibly important and catalytic because you can't go to the, to the other extreme straight away because you won't be able to make that case. So we, for example, have been very lucky. We have um, basically been dependent on grants for this pilot uh, crowdfunding. We started with crowdfunding and then we went to, to grants. And we've now, I mean, we just got, there's new pots of money in, in Africa. There's, we just got this Africa Energy Competition Fund, which is running in 10 or 15 countries, which is traditional development donors now putting their money in these type of initiatives. Um, and, and obviously the type of way they work is that they also do provide you with technical support and mentoring and access to opening doors. I mean, I, I'm the first one to admit I'm very privileged. I'm not African. I mean, I've lived in the continent for a long time. Um, I don't know how anyone, and I've also piloting in a very difficult country. Zimbabwe is a beautiful country, but the, the, unfortunately, the economic crisis never seems to end. So if you're a small scale startup, you, you need those support networks um, or otherwise it's impossible. So I do think it's both looking to open doors at the right time, don't start with trying to open all the doors at once, and looking for allies and networks that can help you open other doors as you go and build the case. A question for Shanta. Um, I I saw a presentation last year where similar vehicles were brought into these communities and then they were used for three to four weeks as long as they were functioning, but then once the first wheel broke off, no one was there to actually you know, repair them and then they were like just left aside. So in your business model, how do you ensure that the maintenance and the sustainability to adopt the technology is there so that it's a long-term functioning business model? So, 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 we, so that's a good question. I don't want to be... I, that, that's been Africa's problem a lot. Um, so, no, we, we started with training. We've got a local train... We did do local assembly. So we've trained local technicians. But now in the pilot area, we're training women. 
Uh, so we're calling them electric lady agents and they're basically community women that know how to change tyres and we're looking at a viable supply chain of spare parts and repairs. Uh, we've been tracking how many accidents, what spare parts we need. Um, so we want this to be very much sustainable um, and, and we don't want to just be a dumping ground. Um, in addition to the tricycle, the whole battery technology is also critical. Um, and so, you know, we don't... In, in China, they use lead acid, which is not really great for rural Africa, so we're testing lithium. But obviously, these are very expensive assets as part of the cost of the tricycle's concern. It's, it's a third of the cost of the tricycle. So we need to actually make sure that that is also well looked after. Um, and we don't want it to be just dumped. So we're looking at the, the life cycle of the battery and renting the battery so that it has a four-year life cycle, so we will obviously be able to replace it. Hello. Uh, first, thank you very much for the very nice presentation. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, there's a personal perspective, but thank you. Uh, to Yusuf, because I'm very glad to see that a gentleman is taking over an initiative for women. It's very yeah. rare. So I just wanted to say that. Um, I just wanted to reflect on what you say about the gap that we have between the different founder where you have, at the beginning, you do your proof of concept, your pilots, and you have a lot of open doors uh, with the development community. And then when you are finished, when you define your ID, you put a lot of energy and so on, you go to the investor, you show your project, and then uh, they question you about the profitability. So there is a huge gap. Um, and so my question is to Frederick, is, is there like some initiative, because I, I don't know an initiative to my lineage, where you decide to collaborate with the development sector to be there right from the beginning, not you know, like funding the uh, proof of concept of the pilots, but making sure that right from the beginning, the entrepreneur know what are the metrics that they're going to be challenged after the proof of concept. Or on the other way around, where the development sector is going to say like, okay, after your proof of concept, that's a dif different type of investor you can see and, and have a support from them. So making sure that this gap is smoother and, and we can bridge the, the gap because I've seen so many good initiatives that just fall into the trap because they didn't receive the right support right from the beginning. So it's an open question to that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, there are some initiatives. There, there are some uh, investment funds dedicated to that. Uh, for instance, you have Acumen, you have Gaia in France. Uh, that's the kind of fund who, funds who will take an entrepreneur from uh, square one, uh, show him what are the requirements of uh, institutional investor, and how to, to market his product, how to, to finalize his business model uh, to make sure uh, it can pass to the next level. Uh, usually, uh, they are closely working with uh, development finance institutions. Uh, each one of them, uh, AFDB, AFD, FMO, uh, they are the, some kind of incubator where you can uh, help uh, an ID grow. Uh, that's not something we, we do at NeoT, we, uh, we are waiting for the next level and uh, when they are ready to, to scale, uh, we will uh, be there to, to provide them with uh, the kind of capex funding they need. Uh, but yeah, I totally agree with you, that's something uh, that needs to be implemented a lot more uh, because too many ideas are, are dying too, too soon. Just to add to that, because I think there is a bit of a disconnect too in terms of the amounts of money. So, you know, there, there is, he, some of the banks and the development banks are looking for deals worth millions of dollars. And then you've got these funds that will give grants of fifteen to $20,000. So you've got sort of silly, unrealistic, you know, for, for your average African entrepreneur, you can't do that much. You can't test a proof of concept seriously for $15,000 anywhere. And then you've got the next level. So I still think there's a huge gap in this middle space. I think your point is really important because that's where we're struggling now. You know what I mean? We can get this money. I'm not ready to ask him for 15 million, although I would like to. Um, but, you know, the in-between is not there. So yeah, one question perhaps to Frédéric. 
Do you get scared when you see a um, potential investee who's being mostly reliant on grants and support from development institutions as opposed to a potential investee who has not and who's from the beginning only had a commercial, fully commercial business model? Do you see those kind of two investees as different and these types of investees as potentially riskier? I think it's uh, it's mainly depend uh, on the sector you want to invest in. Uh, for instance, uh, to come back to mini grids, uh, which according to me will be the the hype for, for the next years, uh, you need uh, public money, you need grants, you need subsidies if you want to to have a profitable project. Uh, let's take an example. Today we are uh, working on a, on a deal in both Uganda and Sierra Leone. Uh, to finance uh, 50 mini grids, uh, it's an investment of uh, roughly 12 million euros, uh, and we get uh, roughly 6 million euros of uh, subsidies uh, from GIZ, uh, which is a German DFI from the European Union, the World Bank, and even with that level of subsidy, uh, we are struggling to reach the profitability uh, targets set by our shareholders. So then you can answer me, your shareholders are too greedy, maybe, uh, but uh, that's life. And honestly, uh, what we are aiming at is uh, within the, the market standards. So depending on uh, the sector you, you are operating, you need that money. Uh, because otherwise you, you would have to sell your electricity uh, at a price uh, way too high for anyone to, to buy a kilowatt or uh, if you don't you, you're just making maybe one two percent of uh, return rate which is not acceptable for, for a private investor and more than bringing money to the table uh, DFIs, uh, public institution uh, they also help you uh, and help local authorities to understand what are the requirements of a private investor and they help you to, uh, to shape uh, the legal framework you, uh, you strongly need uh, to make sure you can be uh, in business in a country for the next 20 years. Uh, a lot can happen within 20 years uh, if you are not protected and backed by strong uh, agreements. Uh, you, you might very well lose your money and uh, if you've been supported by AFDB, uh, World Bank, uh, you name it, uh, when you need to go back to the government and explain uh, what are the, the constraints you are dealing with, uh, they would be more likely to listen to World Bank than to, to Neoti. Thank you. I'm not sure we have time for a last question or just a quick one if there is any. Yes? Okay. Yeah, um, good, mo good afternoon. Um, Roger Christian, I'm, uh, I have a similar project as um, Shanta has, but it's in uh, Kenya. And I, since we don't have much time, I would just like to invite you to uh, the pitch session uh, tomorrow between 1 and 2. Uh, two sorry, between 12 and 1. It's uh, solar electric cycles. We put a solar panel on an on a electric uh, bicycle structure, and we offer, therefore, uh, off-grid power to homes and mobility in the same solution. Well, thank you. Uh, I think uh, we can call this a wrap. Uh, thank you all uh, for uh, being here. I hope that you come back with food for thoughts on the challenges and lessons on uh, what it takes to scale impact solutions in Africa. Uh, for those who were too shy to ask questions, we will stay a bit more just nearby. Uh, there is a session just afterwards, so if you want to uh, discuss and reach out uh, to any of the persons here, uh, we'll be there too uh, and, and pleased to, to, to talk to you. Thank you all and have a good afternoon.